Okay, great. Uh, Rebecca, why don't you start recording? Great. Hello, everybody. Um, glad to see a lot of you here. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Lee Spector, and um, welcome to our talk today, which is Melanie Mitchell, who will be talking to us about artificial intelligence, a guide for thinking humans. Uh, I'm Lee Spector. I'm a professor of computer science here at Amherst College. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Mitchell, um, I want to say a few words about the Artificial Intelligence in the Liberal Arts Initiative that's sponsoring this event. As many of you probably realize, AI technology is rapidly becoming pervasive in our lives. It's playing an increasingly important role in nearly every facet of modern society. Um, it's having significant impacts on science, on commerce, on politics, on medicine, on media, on the arts, and on issues connected to almost every facet of life in modern society. In addition, aside from its practical implications, uh, AI is raising fundamental questions about the nature of our own minds um, and about what it means to be human and how we should treat one another and how we should treat non-human minds should they arise. Uh, all in all, it presents uh, tremendous new opportunities and also potentially uh, new and catastrophic dangers. So the premise of the Artificial Intelligence and the Liberal Arts Initiative is that students and faculty in all disciplines, not just in computer science, should have ways to engage with all of these issues and to explore the use of AI technology and potentially to play a role in the future that this technology will have in human society. In addition to sponsoring talks like today's, we're aiming to provide accessible AI software and hardware. We aim to provide mentors who can work with students and faculty across the disciplines to understand and make use of AI technology um, and an online forum for discussions along with other um, activities and aspects of the initiative. Um, you can find more about what we're doing by checking out liberal-arts.ai, and you can join a discussion of today's event at our forum, uh, which we are just beginning to roll out today, um, and that is at discourse, D-I-S-C-O-U-R-S-E dot liberal-arts.ai, okay? And um, we, we've been uh, scheming this forum, but we uh, we're just starting to really use it today, and there's a topic posted for discussion of today's event. So after this event, if you'd like to chat about it, ask questions and so forth, um, feel free to drop in there and contribute to that discussion. Okay, so now I am really excited to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Melanie Mitchell. Uh, Melanie Mitchell is the Davis Professor of Complexity at the Santa Fe Institute. Her current research focuses on computational abstraction, analogy making, and visual recognition in artificial intelligence systems. She is the author or editor of six books and numerous scholarly papers in the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and complex systems. Her book, Complexity, a Guided Tour, from our Oxford University Press, won the 2010 Phi Beta Kappa Science Book Award and was named by Amazon.com as one of the 10 best science books of 2009. I will note for any of you in the audience who are in my Introduction to Computer Science course that a chapter of that book on cellular automata, life, and the universe is on your required reading uh, for next week, um, and I think you will enjoy it. Um, I will also note for those of you in my Evolutionary Computation Seminar that Dr. Mitchell's Introduction to Genetic Algorithms is a classic in the field, uh, one of the sources when I first got into the field that was particularly helpful to me, um, both in what it covers and the clarity with which it covers. So highly recommended. Um, her latest book is Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. Um, and that is the topic of today's talk as well. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Mitchell, um, who will give a presentation for about 45 minutes, um, after which we'll have time for a bit of Q&A. And when we get to that point of the talk, um, if you wanna raise your hand, or put questions in the chat, um, I will uh, call on people or, or read uh, questions that are in the chat as we have time. All right, thanks so much. And Dr. Mitchell, please take it away. Thank you. And thanks Lee very much for inviting me. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to give, as Lee uh, said, a kind of an overview of my recent book on AI and where it stands today. But first to go back to the past, um, one of the first AI projects was uh, done by Frank Rosenblatt, a, a psychologist back in the 1950s who built uh, the first neural network, what he called the perceptron architecture. And you can see the hardware um, of that uh, with this kind of spaghetti mess of, of, of connections between simulated neurons. And it can do, it could do a few things like recognize uh, letters of the alphabet and handwritten script and uh, things like that. But um, the um, media at the time actually made some even more uh, optimistic claims for it. Uh, he was funded by the Navy and the New York Times in 1958 uh, wrote an article saying that the Navy had revealed the embryo of an electronic computer that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. So, you know, the kind of hype that we see today about artificial intelligence didn't just start recently, but it's been going on ever since the beginning of the field. And even, um, you know, just a few years after that, people as um, prominent as Claude Shannon, who was the inventor of information theory, predicted that within 10 or 15 years that we'd see AI systems or robots that were sort of like what we see in the movies of science fiction. And um, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner, said in 1965 that he thought machines would be capable within 20 years of doing any work that a man could do. Okay, note the sexist language of the 1960s, but the idea that you know we would have human level AI within 20 years of that. And just a few years later, Marvin Minsky, uh, uh, who was the founder of the MIT AI lab, predicted that generation, maybe 20, 25 years, the problem of creating AI would be substantially solved. Of course, none of those things really came to pass. And many years later, another pioneer of AI, John McCarthy said, well, AI was harder than we thought. And I'm gonna talk a little bit in this talk about why it was harder than people thought and why it might still be harder than we think. In fact, such predictions are still going on today. Um, Shane Legg, the um, co-founder of DeepMind, which was uh, acquired by Google, that I'll talk about more later, um, predicted that human level AI would be passed in the mid 2020s. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, said in 2015 that one of the goals for his company was to develop AI that was better than human level at vision, hearing, language, and general cognition. And uh, Stuart Russell, maybe the most conservative of these, this group, uh, uh, who, who is a AI researcher at um, UC Berkeley, said in his most recent book, he asked, when will super intelligent AI arrive? It will probably happen in the lifetime of my children. So, um, and he noted that that was maybe the conservative uh, compared to some other AI researchers. But we're, so we're still getting these uh, predictions of relatively near term sort of human level or even superhuman level AI. So I'm gonna talk about what, what is going on in the field that makes people think that this is really, this might happen and why I might feel a little more pessimistic about the closeness of, uh, of, of, of human level or sort of science fiction like AI systems. So I'll talk about what AI is, the, the, the notion of deep learning, which is the most recent revolution in AI that's making these people very optimistic. Then we'll look closely at machines that learn and try and understand exactly what it is that they learned. And finally, I'll close with some major open challenges for the field. So what is AI? Well, it's hard to define AI, but we can certainly give a lot of examples of things like machines that play chess and go now, that do speech recognition on your phone, can uh, navigate for us within, you know, 
real-time navigation, virtual assistants like Siri or Alexa, you know, translation programs like Google Translate. You know, we've seen a lot about facial recognition and self-driving cars and so on and so on and so on. And so AI is really a big collection of approaches to automating tasks that we might consider require intelligence. Now, if you read AI textbooks, you get different kinds of definitions of the field. Niels Nilsson in the 1970s, in his popular textbook said that it's building machines that perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Okay, but um, then the question comes up, what are these tasks that require human intelligence? Well, we found, for instance, that playing chess at a grandmaster level, which uh, was achieved by an AI system in the uh, 1990s, uh, didn't seem to require anything like human intelligence. It was a very brute force search kind of process. John McCarthy, in his textbook, um, wrote that AI is the study of the common sense world and how a system can find out how to achieve its goals. Okay, so that's a little bit different than sort of the previous definition, but we have to say like, what does that even mean, the common sense world? More recently, um, a committee who wrote this 100 year study on AI from Stanford defined the field as a branch of computer science that studies the properties of intelligence by synthesizing intelligence. So it seems a little bit circular there. So how do we know what the properties are in order to synthesize it? Well, we, we don't really, it, it's hard to list what the properties are exactly. My favorite definition was in a, a paper a few years ago uh, which defined AI as an anarchy of methods. And if you take an AI course, what you'll learn is a bunch of different methods for different uh, kinds of problems. And the anarchy is in that many different people are studying different methods and there's no as yet unifying theory to underlie all of them. So some of the most um, important classes of methods include logic, for instance, trying to get machines to say reason by deduction, like proving from some axioms that um, a proposition is true um, and doing that in, in a kind of um, a way that tries to mimic how people do deductive reasoning. Well, that was really the focus of the early years of AI starting in the 1960s or so to focus on this more logic-based approach, but it actually had many um, limitations and it was really hard to apply these to real world problems. So starting in the 1990s, 19, late, 18, late 1980s to 1990s, people started saying, well, let's not try and program in rules for uh, deduction, deductive logic to try and solve problems, but let's just have machines learn from data using sort of what's called statistical learning. That is, I give you a bunch of, I give the machine a bunch of data points and it tries to build a model, which in this case is just a straight line, but you can think of more complicated models. And that carried on for many, many years. Um, but more recently, what's come into the fore is statistical learning applied to biologically inspired systems such as deep neural networks where you um, particularly inspired by the structure of the human visual system, where um, you have uh, information coming in through the retina to the brain, um, and then being processed over a series of uh, layers in the visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain. And you can see that simulated here as a bunch of different layers in a network in which information is processed in a feed forward way. And that approach is called deep learning. Well, in the, from the 1950s to the 1980s, machine learning was a relatively small part of AI. And deep learning, this uh, sort of simulation of, of brain-like structures was an even smaller part. But in the 1990s, machine learning started taking over. Deep learning was still a very small part because these systems didn't work very well. 
But all of a sudden in the 2010s, machine learning took over almost all of AI and deep learning took over almost all of machine learning because of improvements in uh, the algorithms, but mostly due to very fast parallel computers and very large amounts of data to train these machines on. So let me tell you a little bit about the deep learning revolution that started about 2010. So as I mentioned, you know, the visual system is um, structured in a series of layers where um, very, very roughly it's thought that the initial layers are things like edge detectors, neurons that actually do edge detection, but then feed into other layers that do that uh, process simple shapes to more complex shapes to more complex uh, objects like faces. And that's the structure of what deep neural networks use is this uh, layered structure where each layer has a number of um, uh, a number of independent filters, which filter edges and then simple shapes, complex shapes, all the way to objects. And at the very last layer, um, you get something like a set of categories and the machine uh, predicts what's the most probable category here being boat. Um, now, I just told you that this, this is what it processes, edges, simple shapes, complex shapes, et cetera. But that's not programmed into the deep neural network. In fact, the deep neural network learns from processing data exactly what each of these layers uh, focuses on. So here's something, if you wanna try out a deep neural network on a photo, you can just take a photo of yourself, upload it to Google using its um, photo search, its image search, and it will tell you what it thinks is in the image. And here's me with um, my friend Maggie, who is a great Pyrenees and Google was able to, Google's image search using a deep neural network was able to identify this as a great Pyrenees. Uh, that was pretty impressive. And um, another deep neural network is being used by Google Photos. If you store your photos in the cloud, for example, and you can type in uh, a word or, um, and it, Google will, uh, its deep neural network will find in your photo collection um, an example of that. And this is a, a photo I uploaded. It was not labeled as fountain. I didn't tell the computer it was a fountain, but because the deep neural network that Google Photos is using has been trained on things like fountains, it was able to recognize it. And you've seen you know, Facebook doing facial recognition to tell you that you should tag photos of yourself in somebody else's feed, for example. Um, and a lot of this comes from a project called ImageNet in which um, humans were used to label over a million images as to what objects they contained. And ImageNet um, then said, okay, let's have a competition of, for machines to train on part of these human labeled images and be evaluated on new ones that it hasn't been trained on. And this competition was run for um, a number of years. In 2009, uh, this was the best entry in the competition to recognize objects. This was not a neural network. It was a different kind of um, AI system and it got over 25% wrong. This is the error rate, okay? And the next year, a little bit better, but there was an extremely dramatic drop in um, this competition in 20, uh, 2012, where uh, this was the very first deep neural network that was entered in the competition. And then more and more years went by and the networks got bigger and bigger until finally um, they were surpassing an estimate of human performance on the, this data set. Okay, and I should say that the deep in deep neural networks refers to the number of layers and each of these subsequent uh, better performing systems had 
many, many more layers than the previous one till it gets to something like hundreds and hundreds of layers. So now we get the media reporting on AI. Um, and they say things like computers are now better than humans at recognizing and sorting images. Of course, that's not what this plot actually showed. It showed that the computers were better than humans on this particular data set, not in general. And it turns out that that data set has certain properties that make it not so general. But that's, that nuance is kind of lost in the headlines. We, and that was that sort of incredible view about vision and how machines are now better than humans at recognizing objects was what pushed uh, a lot of companies to say, well, now we can really create self-driving cars because they have the visual systems in the form of deep neural networks that we can use to, they can use to recognize objects on the road like cars and trucks and traffic lights and so on. And we got a lot of predictions from this, like this was from, I think, uh, 2015, uh, from 2020, you'll be a permanent back self seat driver or 10 million self-driving cars will be on the road by 2020. Or from Elon Musk, a year from now, 2019, we'll have over a million cars with full self-driving everything. So this year, 2020, now, you know, two years ago, was supposed to be the big year for self-driving cars, but it didn't happen. AI turns out to be harder than we think. Um, another big uh, success story for AI was due to this company, DeepMind, that I mentioned, which applied something called deep reinforcement learning to Atari video games from the 1970s. If you remember, these games like Breakout, this is a game where you move a paddle uh, here uh, with your cursors and uh, it hits this little ball that uh, uh, collides with these bricks that then explode. And the goal is to uh, get the most points you can in the limited time you have by getting the highest bricks. Okay, so DeepMind had a system that learned just from watching the pixels on the screen and taking actions like moving the, the paddle and watching the score and seeing how well it did to learn how to play this game over many, many uh, uh, hours of, of CPU time. And they applied it, their system to many different Atari video games listed down here. And they found that they were able to um, do better than human level, this is everything above this line, is how much better than human level they did uh, on more than half of the games, including Breakout, where they were more than a thousand percent above human level. <laughs> uh, so this caused, this, this uh, result caused Google to purchase this company, DeepMind, for over half a billion dollars. And DeepMind went on to do things like build AlphaGo, which was able to defeat uh, one of the world's best human Go players, uh, which was a grand challenge for Go, for, for AI for many decades. Okay, so that's the deep learning revolution in a few slides, but um, let's take a closer look at these machines that are learning. Well, if you read the media, you learn, you see things like, we can now build systems that learn how to perform tasks on their own. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration because actually to learn to perform tasks, these systems don't quite work solely on their own. Instead, they have to be trained on photos or language or any kind of data, typically that's been labeled by humans. Okay, so you have to tell the machine what every single thing is in the photo. You have to get some human to label it. And as I mentioned, things like this ImageNet collection has millions of human labeled photos. How, does, how do we get labels? Well, crowdsourcing platforms that pay people to label photos. And now there's many, many companies that pay people to label data for AI systems. So there's a lot of humans there in the loop. Humans also design 
the neural networks. And there's a lot of uh, different design decisions that have to be made, like how big each of the layers have to be and how many layers and what the layers, um, what kinds of functions the layers uh, can apply to the data. And that can be very complicated. So now we have these people who are machine learning engineers who work for companies and actually get paid quite a lot to uh, make it so that machines can learn. So it's not exactly on their own. Then we can ask the question, what did these machines learn? You know, I mentioned that th these systems can be very complicated, can have lots and lots of uh, simulated neurons within each layer and simulated connect connections. Um, now, you know, they're getting into billions and even hundreds of billions of, of parameters, which is the little, the, the strengths on the connections that uh, the machine has to use to learn. So it's very hard to figure out what a machine learned. So in my uh, group, one of my graduate students did a project where he trained a deep neural network to decide if an image contains an animal. And he had a collection of nature photos like these, well, some with animals, some without animals. And over many, um, many sessions of training, the machine would learn how to distinguish these photos, animal versus no animal. And it was able to do extremely well in this task. However, when he went to investigate exactly what the machine had learned, and this is not an easy thing to do, this was the subject of his PhD dissertation, in fact, he found that for this task, the machine often focused on the background rather than the foreground of the image. And that what it was using to decide if the animal, if the image had an animal or not, was whether the background was blurry or not. Because it turns out the photographer, of course, is focusing on the foreground in photos with animals and not the background. Um, the background can be blurry. Whereas in pictures with no animals, they were mostly landscape photos like this that had a clear background. So the machine was actually learning a statistical correlation between blurry backgrounds and animals that was how it was doing well on the task because it's a lot easier to identify a blurry background than it is to identify an animal. This is called a shortcut. You know, it's when the machine learns something that you, that is, allows it to do the task that you gave it, but it's not learning what you wanted it to learn. So if you actually wanted it to generalize and see find animals in photos in general, it uh, wouldn't do well at all. This is a very common thing that happens in machine learning. Here's another example. This was uh, from a paper from 2018 where a group, um, this group took photos that had been classified um, by deep neural networks correctly, fire truck. And this is the confidence with which it's classified, 99%, which is um, you know, maximal confidence. And then they photoshopped the object into unusual poses. And it turned out that, which you know, were not in the original uh, training set. And it turned out that here that the network was 98% confident this was a school bus, 98% confident it was a fireboat and 79% confident it's a bobsled. Okay, so they were showing that, while it seems that it can identify fire trucks, it's, the system is quite brittle in the sense that if you make some change, like changing the pose of the, the object in the photo, um, that changes the classification. And so these machines, like I showed you in the last um, slide, set of slides that, the, these machines are actually learning something about these images that's very different from what humans are perceiving in them. And that, you know, can get in, uh, them into trouble. Like for instance, the Tesla cars are known to have these, uh, when they're on their self-driving mode, the autopilot mode, they can get into crashes where they just crash into a stopped fire truck on the highway because they don't recognize it as a fire truck. It's in a weird pose here. Okay, um, another example of this where the system's learning something different than what we humans think it should be learning. M remember the breakout game where, where it's doing a thousand percent better than humans. And the way that it achieved that was by learning this 
interesting strategy where uh, it learned to knock out all the bricks on one side and then just have the ball bounce along the wall here and um, take out all the highest value bricks. And that's what DeepMind in their paper um, said after 6, 600 episodes of learning, it makes a tunnel around the side and allows the ball to hit blocks by bouncing behind the wall. Okay, so we assume that's what it learned, right? But if you do the, uh, an experiment, which uh, uh, another group did in 2017, where you take a machine learning system that's been trained on the standard version of breakout and is able to do that strategy and then shift up the paddle by a few pixels, it turns out that that system can no longer play the game very well at all. There's something about the specific configuration of the pixels here that's been changed here that really makes the system um, ineffective in a way that a human would never be. And it shows that the system has not learned concepts like paddle and ball and wall and tunnel, the things that we humans sort of ab abstractly learn to um, be able to apply them to new situations. But it's learned configurations of pixels that uh, are hard for humans to, to, to figure out exactly what it's learned, but it clearly hasn't learned a human-like strategy because it's not able to uh, transfer its learning to this situation. Okay, there's also this phenomenon of adversarial attacks on these deep learning systems for, um, that was shown really early on in 2013. Very strangely, in a paper called Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks, it was shown that if you take an image like a school bus that is identified by a school, as a school bus by a deep neural network and add some carefully engineered noise, that is, here's a, uh, another image of pixels, which you can add to the original image. And this is very magnified. It's actually very subtle noise. The new image looks exactly the same, except now the neural network thinks it's an ostrich. And you can engineer these, this noise to cause any of these images, which look exactly the same to us, to fool the neural network into thinking that these are all ostriches. Okay. Well, indeed, that is an intriguing and worrisome property of neural networks. These are called adversarial attacks. And it's been shown that any neural network can be attacked in this way. And in fact, you can, in the physical world, rather just in photos, you can um, put stickers carefully assembled on, say, a stop sign to make a deep neural network vision system in a self-driving car think that it's a speed limit 80 sign. and um, so these systems can do extremely well as long as the data that they're um, getting is similar enough to the data that they've been trained on, but they turn out to be somewhat brittle in that small changes can um, cause them to fail sometimes catastrophically. So AI systems based on deep learning perform really well most of the time but they can fail unpredictably and catastrophically. So the question is to make these systems more reliable and trustworthy, what do we need? Do we need more data, more network layers, or do we need some fundamentally different approach? And this is an ongoing debate in the AI community. Is there a more fundamental lack of understanding in these systems that we humans have, but these systems don't? So in the last part of my talk, I'll talk about some of these major open challenges. Okay, so, so here are some of the major open challenges that I've kind of hinted at. One is what's called few shot learning. Now I told you that these machines are trained on like millions of examples, but we humans can learn from much smaller number of examples. You know, for example, that if I show you pictures like this of bridges, you can learn this concept just from a small number of examples. And then I could give you a new picture and say, is this a bridge? And you would say, you would say yes or no, often very, very accurately. But machines can't do that. They can't be trained on just a few examples. Uh, generalization is a big open problem. So for example, suppose you've learned the concept of a bridge. Well, 
you probably can identify this as a bridge, even though it's quite different from anything you've ever seen before, possibly. Um, and you could identify this as a bridge, even though uh, this is a, a bridge for boats. It's made of water. You have an under uh, a highway that runs under this uh, river and the bridge was created to allow boats to go over the highway. So it's kind of an inversion of a bridge. We're also able to abstract and make analogies. So just following up on this bridge example, you know, you can identify, for instance, this as a bridge of ants that ants are making with their bodies to allow ants to, from the colony to cross over, uh, to, to cross over this gap. We, we use metaphors like bridging our hands or the bridge of a nose or the bridge of a song. And these are metaphorical extensions of a concept that um, often are so natural that we don't even think of them as metaphors. And we're able to extend our notions in this abstract way. We talk about bridging the gender gap and you immediately know what that means. Or Biden who said during his campaign that he's a bridge to a new generation of leaders. You know, we know exactly what that means and you maybe can even imagine Biden kind of bridging his body between the old leaders and the new leaders. And it just goes on and on. I won't uh, go through all of the examples, but um, this is something that's very, uh, really um, different between humans and current AI systems is our ability to extend concepts in this abstract metaphorical way. And it's really at the basis of much of our intelligence. So Hofstadter in his book, in his paper, Analogy as the Core of Cognition, even defined a concept as a package of analogies. Like as I, I was um, illustrating with this concept of bridge. And finally, understanding and common sense is um, what some have called the dark matter of AI. You know, common sense, something that is just things that we know that we use to um, go about our daily lives, things that we know about the world all around us without us even thinking about it, is something that AI systems can't do at all. So here's one example, um, a self-driving car couldn't, was um, confronted with uh, in the Northeast, uh, a snowstorm was coming and uh, some trucks laid out salt lines, but um, then this car had never seen anything like that and it couldn't decide uh, whether they were lane lines or not because it didn't really have the common sense about knowing about storms coming. And in fact, people, the most common accident with self-driving cars is people rear-ending them crashing into them because the self-driving car gets confused about something and slams on the brake. And the pre people person driving in the back of them isn't expecting them to and rear ends them. It's really hard for a self-driving car to figure out what it, what it should stop for because it doesn't have a lot of knowledge about general knowledge about the world. Should it stop if it sees a floating plastic bag? Should it stop if it sees a tumbleweed, something we we see out here in Santa Fe quite a lot, um, a flock of birds. You know, I know that probably the birds will fly away, but how is a car supposed to know that? Should it stop for a pile of glass on the road? Uh, should it worry that this snowman is going to dart across the road in front of it? You know, these are all the, the kinds of things that we humans use our vast knowledge of the world to deal with these kinds of situations. But the fact that there are so many possible weird situations that can happen in the world is what makes AI systems sort of limited in their ability to do things like autonomously drive. So common sense is um, becoming an important thing in the AI world. You know, people like Paul Allen, the founder, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, spent a lot of money founding an institute in Seattle to study common sense and AI. And the US Department of Defense has woken up and said, wait, we can't have the kinds of autonomous uh, soldiers or other kinds of things we want uh, unless we give machines common sense. 
this is really one of the biggest open problems in the field. Okay, um, I'm going to skip all this. Uh, I have a bunch of examples of common sense and so on, but um, I'll just skip to the end here and say that common sense is built around the idea of being able to use concepts like bridge in this extended abstract way. And Hofstadter and Sander, in its wonderful book about analogies called Surfaces and Essences, said without concepts, there can be no thought, and without analogies, there can be no concepts. And I'll just say that how to form and flexibly, flexibly use concepts is the most important open problem in AI today. Um, I talk about all of this a lot more in my book, um, if you're interested, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I'm going to uh, relay some questions to you as they get asked, um, but uh, and people should raise their hand or put things in the chat if they have questions. Uh, I'm going to take the opportunity that I have as the moderator and having the stage right now to ask you one of my own questions, uh, which is specifically about analogy, um, which is, I know is um, a topic near and dear to your heart. And I saw um, some posts that you made um, within the last year um, where you were trying out some of these uh, very impressive language models um, to see if they can solve analogy problems. Um, and I think you've just given everybody a, a good sense of why you think that's such a crucial element of um, the kind of intelligence that we have and that, that we're perhaps aiming for in AI. And I'm wondering if you can um, tell us how you think uh, these systems are doing with respect to being able to solve mm -hmm. analogical world problems. Yeah, that's a great question. So my own dissertation work for my PhD was on getting um, writing a program that can make analogies in an idealized domain. Uh, here's an example problem for you. Um, if the string ABC changes to the string ABD, what does the string PQRS change to? Okay, most people will say PQRT. Uh, so that's a simple one, but you can actually make all kinds of variations on these that uh, get into the, the, these kind of extensions of these concepts. Um, and it turns out that simple as that sounds, we don't have any machines that can uh, solve problems like that, even in that simple idealized domain, uh, uh, anywhere as well as humans. Um, so this is kind of this uh, paradox in AI, which is that machines can do all kinds of really impressive things. Like, you know, they can do machine translation, they can, uh, they can transcribe your speech, they can play Go and beat the best humans, but they can't do a lot of the things that we humans find this the easiest, like, having a conversation here or you know describing a scene uh, that we see in 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 the world like i showed you that scene with the snowman in the middle of the road okay just you know describing something like that or doing these simple analogies um and that shows you know i think um marvin minsky who i quoted had this sort of mantra, which was easy things are hard. And what he meant was the things that are easiest for us tend to be the things that are hardest for computers. And, you know, uh, that, that has remained true throughout the history of the field. And it's really an interesting thing. And I'll just say one more thing that, you know, after all these impressive um, uh, achievements, when I showed you the machine common sense slides from the, the, defen the Defense Department, they have a project, a grand challenge for AI right now, that is to create an AI with the common sense of an 18 month old baby. So that's a grand challenge, even though we can have machines that beat any human at chess or, or go or, you know, other things, we still don't have machines with the common sense of babies and no one knows how to create them. 
So that's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. No, that's that's great. Uh, I, if if I could press you on it a little bit more, though, on your on your recent experiments, which I don't know if you intended to make them. Well, you were you were tweeting about them, so they weren't they weren't private. Um, um, about these systems like GPT three, mm -hmm. these systems you can you can start an essay, and it'll finish your essay, right? Um, you don't can do start this in college though. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll, it'll do a pretty plausible job. Um, you can start writing a Python program. Um, and it actually, and, you know, they, they have these coding assistants that are based on this technology. It'll propose the rest of the program. Um, um, and I believe you were giving it these analogy problems. Mm -hmm. Was it, did it completely flop? Or were there things that it did that surprised you? Or yeah. where, where do you think they are at? Yeah, so these these things like GPT-3, which are these, which are, the generic name is, is a, a large language model. So they learn on lots and lots of text from humans, right? That, that's on, on, the, on the web or in books or whatever. Um, so I gave the, this system uh, these analogy problems and it actually was able to solve some of them, but on some of them, it it did flop, and it's not clear why. You know, these systems are not very transparent, and it couldn't, it can't explain why it's solved one and not the other. It can't explain its reasoning at all, uh, which is makes it harder to you know figure out why it's making the errors that it does. But um, it did surprise me, and. Um, it surprised me both in its successes and its failures. So, uh, but it, you know, it, it really would be interesting to understand more about why it's doing what it does. And I actually have a, I have a blog post that um, that's um, uh, linked from my website about that whole experiment. If people are interested. Great, I, I would love to see that and to share that. Um... We do not have anybody with their hands raised, but I, oh, now I do. Now I see them. Okay, uh, Mateo. Yeah. Hi. Um, am I am I on? Yes, I guess. Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, thanks for the talk. So um, I was a little bit off put, a little bit put off um, by um, those diagrams that you had at the beginning, where you showed. Oh, now machine learning takes the large part of AI and deep learning takes the larger part of machine learning. And I had, and I wanted our students to, so I, I have an agenda with this question. I, I need to admit it. Um, and um, it's, the agenda is that the fact that, um, you know, it seems that these pictures were more about where the research interest is rather than what these fields are really about or what are they composed by or you know what role each of these things play um, in, in in the general AI field. I mean I dare to say that you know 95% of the problems can be solved with logistic regression or decision trees or random forests. Uh, and there are you know billion dollar companies out there that don't write a single don't use a single neural network and will keep making billions forever because random forests solve their problems. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering whether it, your meaning was more like, okay, this is where the research interest is or really the future of machine learning is in deep learning and the future of AI since AI is so much about machine learning now is therefore deep learning. Yeah, um, so I was really um, focused more on the, the research community and the papers published in the field than what people in industry are doing um, and how they're solving problems. So if you look at, you know, Triple AI, which is the uh, mo probably the most prominent AI conference, and look at sort of the percentage of papers that use deep learning or some kind of machine learning, it's almost all of them. <laughs> but you're right, in industry, there are still a lot of uh, very, uh, you know, lucrative applications that don't use neural nets at all. So right, but I, I'm going to say that even you know, most of the applications that we need, no matter whether they're in industry or not, may not need deep learning. 
yeah, it's poss it's po possibly true. Yeah. All right. Th thanks, Mateo. Um, uh, tai Chi. Hi, um, I had a kind of follow up question um, from what Professor Spector was asking earlier um, about language models and how, you know, those models can kind of exhibit those kind of analogy making behaviors in some aspects, but then it fails. And I read the blog post that you wrote, and I was also pretty fascinated by it. And I think for me, um, I'm wondering what, you know, what kind of um, approaches to machine learning that you personally think um, could be more promising rather than language models that are, you know, just massive and just, you know, you throw a bunch of data at it and have like giant parameter sizes. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I, I, I think that it's really important to, to have for, for systems to, to have some kind of prior knowledge that they can build on as opposed to learning from scratch. And to have some kind of um, internal model of, of the world, of, of their world, whatever their world is. So, you know, from GPT-3, uh, one of these language models um, generates text. It's just using um, probabilities of, you know, what the next word should be to um, generate word after word after word. It's not using any kind of conception of what those words are about. So when it talks about a birthday cake, it just has some probability that cake follows birthday. It doesn't know what a birthday is or what a birthday cake is or that. And it may, you know, if you ask it, can you eat a birthday cake? It has some correlation between eating and birthday cake. And so it will tell you, yes, you can eat a birthday cake. And, but it doesn't have any notion of like what that whole thing is about. So that whole idea of sort of understanding and meaning is going to be essential how we get machines that do that uh, is, is, is a big question, you know, and that's something that I'm, I am personally working on. And one of the ways that we get meaning is I think through analogy, through um, having some experience and being able to abstract it in a way that we can make analogies with new experiences. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, John Manley. Hi there. Um, so I've actually got sort of two relatively related questions. So one of them is just to um, is asking you to just sort of say more about this question of because um, I've seen this come up in other contexts building um, building these systems in ways that are sort of better instrumented so that they can explain why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, I remember reading something about how critical this was going to be, or how some critical you know particular author thought this was going to be, and things like. Um, you know, medical, you know, you know, when you're analyzing medical images, right? Because it's important, you know, not just that you get a result, but that you have some idea why the thing thought that thing, particularly if that, if the thing it concludes differs from the opinion of, you know, say the human doctors on the case. Um, and that seems sort of somewhat related to the, to another question, which is, um, you know, your, your example there about how these systems can be fooled by these very subtle pixel changes in analyzing pictures um, seems, you know, so I'm an IT person. And so like you know, information security is a big deal. And like the notion that these things can be fooled in this way that is, uh, you, you know, that would completely go by a human, you know, a human overseer, um, you know, is, is, is pretty alarming. Um, and I guess I'm wondering like, is, like, is that just a matter of, better data, you know, better training, better data sets, you know, more data, or, you know, could you like, you know, could you solve that problem with sort of a bigger training, you know, a bigger training set? Uh, <laughs> I guess those are sort of my two questions. Yeah, there. those are good questions. Uh, so the first question about explainability, yeah, so that there's a whole sub area of AI now devoted to sort of explainability uh, or transparency. And, and there's many different approaches, you know, one, might be like the one that my student with the animal, not, no animal task, you know, he took a, a, he was trying to identify the pixels that were being used to make the decision. And that 
can tell you some things, but not everything. So that's that's a, a thing that people have been working on for a while. Um, it, you know, trying to sort of highlight what aspects of the input were being used in the decision, but it's often hard to figure that out exactly. Um, and that doesn't always give you an explanation, like why did you use those pixels? <laughs> um, so this is still an, a big open question for this explainability thing. It's really important. Uh, and nobody knows, like a, without having a kind of metacognition, the kind of metacognition we have, which, which means that we are sort of aware of our own thinking. And we know we sometimes, not always, I would say, know why we do certain things. You know, sometimes you do things and you you kind of don't know exactly why you did them, or you you think you know, but you, you, there was actually another subconscious reason. So you know, I wouldn't say humans are perfect at explaining themselves, but they're certainly better than machines. So that's a really big open question. The second thing you you mentioned was these um, adversarial attacks. So this is another big sub area of AI research now is um, what makes systems vulnerable? How do we defend against these attacks? Does increasing the data or, or doing some other manipulations to the data def help defend it, uh, these systems? And, you know, it seems like these vulnerabilities um, have a lot to do with the way that the, the machine learning is being performed in that, um, Basically, you know, there, the idea is that you have this, this space, you can think of a space of a vector space of, of uh, examples that you're trying to divide up into like cats, dogs, boats, cars, whatever. And that if you do some, if you, if you um, represent your whole concept space as this kind of vector space, you're going to be vulnerable no matter what. Uh, so people are thinking of like new ways of knowledge representation that might be more robust. But it, it is, it's still a big an area of research that if you look at the papers that are published at the machine learning conferences, you know, maybe a third of them are on this sort of adversarial uh, uh, example, adversarial attack uh, topic. <laughs> awesome, uh, thank you. Uh, Michael, a question. Uh, hey, Professor. Um, I actually have a lot of questions to ask, so I, I kind of want to know your time constraints. Uh, the time constraint is we're going to wrap up at five, so I think you get one. <laughs> okay, so um, so like I, I have a lot, I've been thinking a lot about this, and like something that I was thinking about is like, first of all, have we even understood exactly our definitions of intelligence? Uh, for example, like I think in psychology, there's something called the overall G factor, and it's like highly, it's one of the most highly correlated of intelligence and IQ, but do we even understand what that G factor is? And then the other thing is like kind of related low is like, I, I completely agree with you that like analogies, abstraction, conceptual, like these words are, are, are I think are key to the to our understanding of intelligence. But, but, but then like, I think about them and like, I, like, I don't think I have a complete I don't think I have a satisfactory definition of, of these words, even though I could use them and I could understand examples of them. And, and I think like, like right now, like this, this current way of doing AI, like it, it doesn't seem like it's really, you know, like implementing like truly what abstraction analogies and, and, and I, what, what really concept is. And I think the one of the issues, like, are we even sure we fully have a, like a good enough grasp of an understanding of what concept is such that we can implement it into right. AI. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's a great question. We don't have good definitions for these terms. They're not like form formal definitions of what intelligence or concept or all these terms are. They're, they're kind of placeholders for more detailed, more uh, mathematical definitions. And I think, you know, there's the word intelligence, as you pointed out, it's, it's used in many different ways. You know, what you refer to as the G factor is really a way of thinking about comparing intelligence between people, as opposed to the question of like, our hum, you know, human intelligence is a thing that we're aiming at in AI, and yet saying like, what is that exactly? So yeah, these, these are all great questions. So th thank you. That was a great question. Great answer. Um, I, I'll I'll point out that um, one of the side effects of this discussion, um, I think reverberating through the field, 
is it helps us to understand what we don't understand um, about intelligence in the first place. Yeah. Um, so trying to make computers do it and seeing how they fail maybe helps us to understand what concepts are um, yeah, you know, in psychology and in philosophy and uh, philosophy of language and so forth. So I think there's a lot of great interdisciplinary conversation that can stem from this. Um, as I told uh, Melanie when we set this up, um, I was really delighted to have her here, but I hope that I can lure her back and maybe even in person to have some more extended conversations and interdisciplinary uh, conversations with people uh, ac across campus in, in many different areas. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope everybody, maybe we can uh, unmute for a moment and can give uh, Dr. Mitchell some applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And uh, please do, uh, if you want to continue the discussion, uh, go to discourse, D-I-S-C-O-U-R-S-E dot liberal dash arts dot A-I. And there's a thread there that I think has nothing in it yet, but I hope we'll have a conversation. Uh, anybody on campus who wants to talk about these issues. Um, and please keep an eye out for um, future events in this series later in the semester. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.